John Drew and the John Myatt case must rank right at the top. But the problem was we were being scanned by a very intelligent person. 160 million oh, multi-level at 160 million. Here it is. And 170 uh, million dollars. People, people can we get imps? Here is then the gentleman's bid, ladies and gentlemen, at 170 million. Lord of Warhol is selling here. 170 million dollars. Lord of Warhol is selling here. They wouldn't know anything about flipping shoe sizes anyway, little imps. They don't. Alberto Giacometti, painted in emulsion and covered in tea, coffee, and Hoover dust, audaciously passed off as original oil paintings under the art world's noses. The con was masterminded by a cool and calculating criminal with an IQ of 165, whose name was John Drew. He enticed struggling cash-strapped single parent John Myatt into his intricate and almost foolproof scam. John Drew has got a huge amount of money. So, here we get on to... Welcome back to Journey of a Confused Artist. <laughs> and as we follow on from the previous one, we're looking at the art world in terms of paint your own money, fraud and forgery. The first story we had was regarding a um, ex um, art student from um, Central St. Martins and uh, a criminal, Billy the Brush, uh, Mumford, um, from a criminal institute from Her Majesty. Now we're getting on to the second story and it's, as, as you heard just before, quite um, an alarming story of just uh, a single parent wanting to look after his children um, having um, the fact that he was good at art um, being abused basically by a criminal now this criminal um, and we get back to the um, artist should we say um, his name was um, John Myatt and he was from Stafford UK he was a single parent looking after his little kids and he actually placed an advert in Private Eye magazine and was very 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 honest with it and he said genuine fake art created for as little as £150 now, uh, I'm looking at it at the moment, the advert. Um, and I've experienced this in Turkey myself when uh, in the bazaar you will see they have signs saying genuine fake watches. You know, we're not disguising it. It is genuine fake and it's up to you if you want it. And this is the price for it. And so he placed that in Private Eye magazine, uh, £150. And he then got approached by a very, very suave, sophisticated, intelligent genius um, called John Drew, who happened to have an IQ of 165. Like, who cares? Um, but obviously he was very, very intelligent and he approached uh, John Meyer and under the pretense asked him to um, create for his own house fake artwork. Uh, pretty much was testing him really. Um, and um, John Meyer was doing it with, like I've got here, household emotion paints and things like that, you know. For all testers. Um, so that's what he was kind of using, this, that, and the other. And what um, actually John Drew was doing behind the scenes was he infiltrated um, the galleries and the archives, uh, like the Tate Gallery, because what he realized is the most important thing for um, any kind of collector is not the artwork per se. It is the providence. Now, to get the providence, 
of uh, the MOT of that particular artwork. Um, it has to be vetted and, you know, obviously researched. So even infiltrated um, the archive sections of um, large establishments like um, Tate and gathered all this research information about each painting, even as far as, because it's not what it looks like um, on the front, a lot of it is to do with what's on the back of the actual painting because that will indicate, you know, the authenticity of it. And he found out all these facts and figures and everything because he was involved in it all. And so it was like a historical ledger and he had access to it all. Um, and so he was getting to himself in a position where he could authenticate Anticipate um, certain art, and so having someone creating fake art, he would authenticity, authenticity, um, look at it and give it a, a yes, thumbs up, like you do on Facebook, um, and yeah, then th therefore it would go forward to um, auction houses and for collectors and basically faking all these, you know, uh, providences, you know, these stamps of approval saying that this artwork was original uh, and it, it, it wasn't. And it was a massive, massive kind of um, thumb, well, fingers up to uh, the art world. And um, like I said before, the art world is governed um, by a very, very small amount of people. So all he had to do was overcome them with an IQ of 165. He thought, uh, you're just money, all talk, not really thinking about what you're doing. I'm thinking more above and beyond you. And um, yeah, took them to the bloody cleaners, as it were. So there you go, another little story. Now, the thing about this story is its impact, um, not just on the fact that um, they were painting their own money and um, creating forgeries and the art world was being stupid enough to believe it all, but it gets down to authentication. Um, now, collectors are questioning a lot lot more so there is now the distrust in the art community and in auction houses with regards to authenticity of these artworks you know if someone can go in and fake uh, uh, and, and say that you know um, this is authentic who do you believe and when millions and millions of pounds are involved in the equation of someone stamping and signing a piece of paper and everything's like, you know, completely not what you expect or see, it's, it's never real, um, gives you cause for concern. So that's just a small little, little, little bit of uh, more corruption in the art world with fraud and forgeries. Uh, there are a lot more stories that you're going to find out later on as we move forward uh, in this journey of a confused artist. Um, things, by the way, are going really well. Yeah, like I'm showing you here, um, did a lot of writing today with regards to um, the actual next book in terms of where I am at the departure gate and <laughs> the little stories that are happening. Um, pretty much about this young lady that um, she had her kids, her little tiny kids, and she had chips and there were um, tomato ketchup and the kids were dunking their chips into the tomato, tomato ketchup and just sucking off the tomato ketchup. They didn't really care about the chips. It was as if it was the chemical and the taste and everything from the tomato ketchup that was a more important thing than the actual chips. So they were just like discarding that. And I found that really quite kind of upsetting in a way, you know, um, but very, very interesting to sort of see, you know, uh, how kids' taste buds change. 
let's think about the next in the series of Journey of a Confused Artist. Become a subscribe and you'll learn even more. We are going to be investigating a lot more in the future ones about the price of art. Now, the next uh, video, um, not kind of criminal, but it's going to be a little bit more about who controls and markets the art world. How does it actually function and work? And this will be quite important for um, a lot of artists that want representation at art galleries. Um, us artists million. get inundated the all the time with dangling characters. Um, you would like to represent your artwork. We've seen it. Here is um, the gentleman at 170 million. It'll only cost the you wall. 25 pounds per entry. Blah, blah, blah. everything costs money and they pray and million. dangle like I said Mark's bid at 34 million, 35 million, 36 million with Loic, 37 million against you Loic at 37, um, yeah. 40 million Amy's and if it's not just that um, of you in a there at art 40 residencies uh, around the world Two. 42 to million investigate Mark's and to see your art million. Come at a cost. 43 million with Amy now. And you will always 43 have 43 million dollars against you, Mark. Um, at 43, 44 like I say, million. Even exhibiting Mark's your art. At 44 um, million now. If you want it represented around dollars. the world, then you with can Mark go and have it put up in a pop up stand in Milan. It will cost you 1,000, whatever it is per square. You know, everything. Everything's at a cost. Um, and as much as us artists, um, want to have that time and privilege to be able to not worry about money and bills um, imposing on our creativity we can focus um, that's very difficult to get to um, I, I am so envious of anyone that's got to that stage and uh, please leave any messages below if you are that kind of person please you know let us confused artists know you know the trials and tribulations that you've gone through obviously there's not going to be any kind of immediate um, fix it by pushing a little button and blah 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 every artist is different and and flavors and what's hot in the art world and what sells what doesn't sell all these kind of elements um, come into effect when you want to get to that level of being able to pursue your creativity without having to worry about bills uh, and everything like that influxing and, and diverting your attention and hopefully, um, you know, sort of, uh, I'm working on this at the moment, um, and yet again, I'm not going to zoom in on it. It's going to be a Mother's Day little thing. My mum has uh, requested colours. David, your artwork's too melodramatic, it's too dark, I want something bright. And <laughs> it's quite difficult to do, but um, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm going to add some layers and, and more layers on it uh, and I hope that you guys are um, still experimenting overcoming those fears uh, if you've got any kind of questions you know regards to like well how 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 would you price your artwork you know is it by the size is it by the material is it the time that it's taken someone can take you know five days to do a, a little square like that and an artist could do it in five seconds you know, which one's better than the other so it is down to uh, the perception of who wants to buy and their taste and everyone's got different tastes and I suppose investigating how movements through the centuries and art movements follow those cultural changes don't they you know back in the 60s we were really uh, getting in on pop art and you know that kind of vibrant kind of color schemes and commercialization 
and then it started shifting a little bit more into um, expressionism and breaking boundaries of what is conceptual art and what is deemed as traditional art whether it be painting on canvases and and then we're sort of saying well contemporary art can like culminate different types of materials and and it all starts moving forward so you get into this kind of stage where you know the movement in art is very very reflective of um, the environment and the society um, and values will change and therefore prices will change perceptions will change of the different artwork you're producing and you have to look at it in terms of are you producing artwork for yourself or are you producing it for that and if you're doing it for that then therefore it's a business and then you have to change your mindset into that. And if you're just doing it for that, then hopefully you're in that position where you don't even have to worry about money. And that's why you can just do it from the heart. But for a lot of other artists, it's to do with that. And they're kind of like constricted and governed by the direction that their art takes. Whereas from the heart kind of artists, it's very simple. I don't have to worry about any constraints like that. I can just create what I want to express and how I want to do it, when I want to do it. Um, and like I said, the starving artist doesn't have that um, privilege. Um, and there's that added kind of pressure. And then you've got to think to yourself, do you actually do this kind of art as a hobby in between um, your full-time work? at that at the moment i'm looking for full-time work and it's extremely difficult especially at my age stop rambling david finish it off move on to the next one the next one like i said is going to be about who controls the market area of the art million. world from Maryland, auction houses all the million. way down Here it is, at you know, and, and million the processes and the criteria that they look at and selling so I hope this has been beneficial. Welcome to all the new subscribers. And to all my current subscribers. And uh, look forward to seeing you on the next Mark's one. Mark's bid at $34 million, $35 million, $36 million with Loic, $37 million against you, Loic, at $37, $40 million. Amy's bidder at $40 million. Four of you in a huddle there at $40 million. Forty-one, two. $42 million. Mark's bidder now at $42 million. At $43 million with Amy now. At $43 million. Against you, Mark, at $43. $44 million. Mark's bidder at $44 million now. At $44 million. With Mark at $44 million. At $44 million. Mark's bidder at $45 million. $45 